The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 3, Four Steps to Better Habits. So the following chapter and analysis we're going to go through with Atomic Habits here is understanding the foundation of how do we establish habits, how are habits formed, what is the psychological framework we need to understand about our brain. So then we can create constructive habits, rewire destructive habits, and build the framework of psychological understanding for habits. So why your brain builds habits? Your habits are a series of automated solutions that solve the problems you face regularly with as little effort and energy as possible. Habits are reliable solutions to recurring problems in our environment. Our body and brain will manufacture habits to prolong and our survival. So the habits may not be like it's interesting because you look at impoverished communities, you look at low social economic areas, people who come from poverty, people who come from Uh, war-torn countries, they have developed a series of habits to maximize survival. We see this in, in adults who have gone through childhood trauma. There's a series of automated solutions the body has designed and created uh, out of the trauma, out of the stress of the environment to keep the organism functioning and surviving. Now, When that stressor is gone, when that insult is no longer present, the habit can continue to manifest itself. We see this in all types of, you know, uh, what we call neurotic holding patterns, a term I got from Elliot Hulse, uh, where people will store uh, or will present certain dysfunctional habits. You know, it can be uh, rapid blinking, can be one, which can also be a symptom of, uh, you know, ADHD. Uh, potentially, or some type of hyperactivity, Um, but it can be verbal speech impediments, verbal, like, here's one, saying sorry, commonly, like, everybody knows somebody who says sorry about everything, right, it's like, oh, sorry, you know, you ask, they always think they're in the, they're in their way, they're in your way, and they're constantly saying sorry, and Often this type of person that presents with the sorry, sorry, sorry type of response to most things is a person who has learnt, uh, who has grown up in an environment who has always felt like they've been in, in the way of somebody else, made to feel like their presence wasn't important and their presence was actually, you know, the opposite. They were in the way. What are you doing here? And they've constantly had to survive by uh, placating to their environment, by subverting themselves to their authority. I'm sorry, dad. I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry. I'm like constantly growing up with this uh, behavioral tendency to avoid and manage conflict. Okay, so I just think it's a really real example that we often see day to day of how our habits, uh, how our body creates solutions to problems in our environment. We all have our version of that. It's about recognizing and acknowledging them. And then, okay, what can we do about them now? Let's go into that. So your habits create cognitive scripts and associations that your brain habitually learns. And there's this app, if this, if this, then that. It's it's, uh, it's a cue. If this cue, then that reward, then that response. You go f- uh, you go for a run when you get home from work because you're stressed. It's creating associations. You grab the food uh, out of an emotional anguish that you're experiencing. You feel out of control. You want to seek some control. You can control what you eat. You can control the foods you consume. And so you overeat because you're trying to gain further control over your environment. You know, now we're starting to understand some of the psychological problems to why people overeat or why people end up in self-destructive eating behaviors. Oh, you're trying to seek control. Oh, you don't have a lot of control in your life. Okay. 
Another one, every time you sit down in front of the TV to watch something, you eat as well because you associate heightened enjoyment from eating and entertainment. You're making associations. This is one I do. You know, I don't just sit down usually and eat. I usually couple the behavior with something, whether it's listening to an audiobook, whether it's reading, whether it's watching something educational, or whether it's watching something entertaining, right? But often, I don't. And people don't just sit down stare at a wall and breathe and eat. And now maybe this is a problem too, right? Because that can become a, its own destructive habit if you're eating in a heightened, jacked up, sympathetic state. We continue. Habits reduce cognitive load and free up mental capacity so you can free up and allocate your attention to other tasks. So there is an efficiency, there is a utility to habit formation and system formation because now I can free up my attention and put it elsewhere. If I have so many things running in the background automated, now I can focus on what really matters. But then there's this question, doesn't routine and habit restrict me from the spontaneity and freedom of life? I think there is this stigma and stereotype amongst certain populations of people, certain people, certain maybe less conscientious, industrious people who see someone who has routine and habits and structure and sees that as constricting. And it is quite a counterproductive thought and actually counterintuitive thought to and belief to hold, you know, because it's actually freeing. Why it is so? Let's go into why. So let's assume habits are restricting. Let's presume they are, right? This presumption assumes that you have chosen between building habits and attaining freedom. Instead, habits don't restrict freedom, they create it. You need good habits and good systems to create freedom and the, the things that you desire and want. See, the person who weighs their food on a meal-by-meal -meal basis does that to create the freedom and ability and outcome to change their body and their minds and their health. If they don't, then they're guessing. If they're not, if they're, if they're guessing, they're not assessing. If they're not measuring, they're not managing. Random actions, random results. Thus, habits don't restrict freedom, they create it. Without productive financial habits, you will continually struggle to save and invest in what you want. Without productive health habits, your energy, vitality, mental health, and well-being will suffer unnecessarily. So you'll be less free to enjoy and get the most out of life. And so maybe the minute or so I spend per meal to weigh and measure my food is superficially constricting. But what that actually creates on the back end as a result of that is very freeing because now I'm in control. And, you know, seeking control is something that many of us thrive in. You don't want to be out of control. That is chaos. That is where the unknown lies. That, and if you want something, you generally need to control it. You need, the, you need to control the, the variables and understand them. And so that's a, where that can be a useful habit for many people. If you're always being forced to make decisions about simple tasks like when should I work out, when should I read, when do I have time to study, what should I eat, how much should I eat, I want to lose weight, I want to gain muscle, how much should... You don't need to ask these questions and waste the time constantly. I don't think about these things. They're automated. I got the meal plan set. I sit down. My coach will change it routinely, quarterly. But I know what I'm eating, how much of what I'm eating per my outcomes and processes that I'm trying to change about myself. And it's not to say that will be constant because there is an element, everybody gets to a point of maintenance, right? And that is where you could peel back some of these habits and live more ad libitum, meaning uh, doing as you like, living freely uh, without the certain habits or controlling so much what you eat, okay? 
But when I work out, it's, it's not a question. When I read, now that is something that's more in the air for someone uh, for, uh, right now for myself. However, when you stack habits together, you can begin to take, use these things to more advantage because you, know, you might listen to an audio book while you walk, while you're on the treadmill, while you're eating. When should you work out? Well, if you associate the habits together, which is something we're going to dive very deeply into in later chapters and how we actually habit stack and form habits, I'm kind of preempting it. Um, you make these associations. All right, I get up, I do this. If this, then that. Associations connected. It's not a question of when I work out. It's now a habit that's formed based on association of my environment that I've made. And I've blocked out time. There's uninterrupted time. No people cannot book me here. So if you're always forced to make decisions about simple tasks, uh, you actually have less time and less freedom because you're spending so much time on deciding what to do. When are we going to go eat? What are we going to eat? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? Now instead, or like the question is, like, what am I going to do? What do you what, like? If, instead, if you had a habit, instead, you wouldn't need to decide what to do each day. You would just do it at the time and place you committed yourself to do it. Now, at some point, you need to sit down and decide what you want to do, right? Okay, that's another example of blocking out time. Perhaps at the start or the bookends of your day, the start or end of every day, you're sitting down and you're like, okay, what are three tasks I need to get done tomorrow? Three projects I want to get done tomorrow. Um, what are some things I need to block out in my calendar? Now, I don't need to just... And you don't you don't go about your life just in a in a in a confused haze of like just drudgery of like one task to the next and just mindless activity. No, it's disciplined action. I'm I'm sitting down doing the do, uh, doing these video uh, audio essays and the and these deep comprehensive analysis of these books. This didn't get done until I decided to block out time to do it. You don't just turn on a camera, set up a bunch of audio equipment, hit record, and then get all, get all your notes in front of you just by accident. You don't just rock, you don't just stumble upon the gym and just, oh, look, I'm at the gym now. Oh, look, I'm eating healthy now. Oh, look, I'm going for a run now. Oh, look, I'm studying now. It doesn't just happen. And if it does happen by some coincidence, one off, it's just usually one off or random. And once again, if unless you're okay with the random, all right, I'm just going to do this whenever I feel like it. You have to be okay with the consequences that doing whatever you feel like it is going to get whatever you feel like it results, which is pretty inconsistent and not very visible and not much change is going to occur from I'm going to do it when I feel like it. But maybe you make peace with that. And that's not about, it's not, but at the same time, we've got to recognize that there's going to be things that we need to do that you can't just turn up to work when you feel like it because your manager is not going to accept that because you won't have a job anymore at some point. Something's holding you, something, something's, every, we get held, held accountable in every way to certain tasks and habits, whether we go in lines in supermarkets and airports, or we get triggered to do our taxes because it's that time of year, or you're like we're all triggered and cued inevitably to make decisions and commitments. Other people are making them for you, but what if you could make them for yourself as well? Ones that you want to make. Now we're going to get into the science of habits. It's basically a neurological feedback habit loop. How can we understand this habit loop that we're all that we're all interact with every time we, we commit to a habit and perform a habit? So I talked about this in chapter one, this cue craving response reward habit loop. Now that we're going to dissect it a little bit more here. We're going to talk about it. So number one. Q. This is noticing the reward. This is the problem phase. This is when we trigger the brain to initiate the behavior we need or desire. So something cues us. Like I said in the first video, the sun comes out, the blinds open, or maybe they close. 
the we hear certain song certain music and that may trigger a certain craving to do something there's we all have music that's associated with certain behaviors you might have music that is that's associated with uh tranquility and relaxation and you might have music that's associated with you know uh, exercise and high heart rate and stimulation this cue leads to a craving well the craving is is the want of the reward this is the motivational force behind the habit. What you crave is not the habit itself, but the change itself it delivers. You don't crave smoking a cigarette. You crave the relief it provides you. You crave the reward and feeling it gives you. You don't want to turn on the TV. That's, that's not what you want. What you want is to be entertained and relaxed. Every craving is linked to a desire to change your internal state. And this desire to change your internal state is arguably, Buddhism calls, the root of all suffering, which makes a lot of sense to me. and something I'm, I'm going to talk about in, uh, in my summary of sapiens, which is also should be on this channel by now. So, Q, craving, the motivational force behind the habit. Notice the cra- we get cravings all the time. It's not... And then as a, after that, we get the response. This, this is obtaining the reward. This is now the solution phase. This is the habit you perform. A response is dictated by how motivated or disciplined and how much friction or effort is associated with the behavior. The response delivers the reward. You're going to do the thing. You're going to get the cigarette. You're lighting it up. You're going to get the food. You're bringing it to your mouth. You're eating it. You're going to exercise. You're going to read. You're going to do a behavior. Then you get the reward. They're very tightly linked. This is being satisfied now. You're being satisfied by the reward. Now, the reward can be very dopaminergic, um, very... Very neurological, very, it can be tightly linked to a lot of these neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin, which trigger feelings of euphoria in us and just heighten our mood. So we chase these rewards because they, they satisfy us, they satiate us, and these are tightly linked with our physiology, like those neurotransmitters I mentioned. They satisfy our cravings and they deliver contentment and relief from the cravings. They, they, they lower our cortisol, maybe. Make us feel more relaxed. You know, like breathing. Like the result of doing some Wim Hof breathing is an alert, stimulated, calm state. They also teach us. The reward teaches us which actions are worth remembering in the future. So there is an evolutionary uh, mechanism behind how habits teach us things. Oh, I put hand on fire, bad. Hand on fire, hurt. Homer hurt. You know, it's it's this very, it's like, it's a very basic primitive thing. So that is the four, that's the science of habits. That That's the, the four steps behind habit formation. Cue, craving, response, reward. Now, this is now like, Let's be observant now. Let's not just not, let's not just listen to this, listen to me speak and read these books, but let's now apply them. Okay, let's all right, what's a behavior that you can apply that to? Well, all of them, but like what's something you do in your life now you can think about that you can oh, so that's the craving I get. Like think about it, like actually think about this and how it ties into your own habits. If a behavior is insufficient in any of these four stages, it won't be, won't become a habit. Eliminate the cue, your habit won't start. Reduce the craving, you won't experience enough drive to act. Make the response behavior too difficult and you won't be able to do it. If I put the cigarette on top of a cliff that you can't reach, you can't grab it. If the reward fails to satisfy your desire, then you'll have less or no reason to do it again in the future. If I give you a sugar replacement, but it tastes like terrible, 
You're not, that's not, not going to do it again. But if I give you a sugar replacement, hello monk fruit, hello allulose, and like, oh, that tastes almost the same as sugar. Now, I can give you this incredible replacement without the same caloric or metabolic uh, destructiveness. So, very important stages. If there's a problem to eat any of the stages, the habit will, the loop will be broken. The habit won't form or won't continue. All behavior is driven by your desire to solve a problem. Chase pleasure or mitigate pain. So how is your habit trying or how, how is the things we do on a day to day trying to chase pleasure or, or mitigate pain? I believe that's a, from Sigmund, Sigmund Freud uh, type of psychological framework. E.g. Q. Now we're going to get into some examples. You wake up tired and groggy. Craving, you want to feel alert and energized. Response, drink coffee. Reward, you feel alert. Drinking coffee is now associated with being alert in the morning upon waking. You have created an association and habit with also your environment. Another example. Q, you see and smell sweet desserts in your home. Craving, you begin to crave the pleasure of the desserts. Response, you eat it. Reward, you satisfy your craving and enjoy the pleasure of the desserts. Equals, seeing and smelling desserts in your home becomes associated with the pleasure of eating donuts. So now every time, potentially, you see and smell desserts in your home, uh-oh, are you ready? Because you're probably going to eat them. So, how do we stop that habit? How do we manage that habit? Well, Q. We make the Q difficult or invisible. Now, again, I'm preempting future chapters here, but just think about, because I know some of you are going to listen to this and not other ones, and everyone has problems, right? So maybe you can be like, oh, man, i got a problem with eating. Make it invisible. Out of sight, out of mind. How can you, if you're not cued to do it, it won't happen. So how do you eliminate the cue? Eliminate the cue. Put them away. Don't bring them in the house. All right? Tired and groggy. Why are you tired and groggy? What's the cue to make you feel tired and groggy? It didn't happen that day. It happened the day before, the day before, and the week before, and the month before. So then you have to look at the behavior to look at your, your, your energy problems. Okay, are you, getting are you getting to bed late? Why are you getting to bed late? Because you have to wake up early. Your body's waking up early, all right? How, well, you get better late. What do you got to do to cue yourself now to get to bed earlier? Now you got to look at that habit. You got to understand that you're going to be like, oh, I just want to drink the coffee. I got to stop drinking so much coffee. And you're going to exert willpower. You're going to waste all this energy. Yeah, that's dumb. You're wasting energy, you're wasting willpower, you're wasting time. You're, you're, it's just stupid. You got to look at the behavior, dissect the behavior like you're a scientist dissecting a, a bug or a piece of, uh, like a, you're an engineer. You're, 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 don't even look at it like yourself. Look at it like you're a machine. You're trying to optimize a, like a robot, like a machine. Oh, well. Why would you waste all the fuel on trying to, I want to drink the coffee, but I just no, put it down. Waste. You wasted fuel. Look at the day before. How can you make that better so you can be more successful in the day ahead? Getting to bed earlier, looking at, looking at food habits and nutrition habits and uh, supplementation and uh, you know your, your exercise regime. Oh, now you feel better. You got to attack it from other variables. Sometimes you can't necessarily look at the direct cue. You have to look at what got you there in the first place. So before we know it, hundreds of different habits are running our lives and most of us aren't even aware of them or didn't consciously choose to create them in adulthood. Instead, many are actually indoctrinated, programmed and conditioned into us as a child. Now, this is where the real insidious habits uh, form and prolong. And proliferate because then we pass them on to other people we encourage them subconsciously consciously to our children to our brothers and sisters and family and friends 
Now you're about, now you're around a bunch of losers who are doing the same destructive habits as you. You're both all enabling each other, or you're hiring a bunch of winners, doing a bunch of winner shit. You're all running together. You guys are all studying together. You're all expressing gratitude consistently. It's like you hear one person express gratitude, you know, that makes you feel grateful. Hmm. It makes you think more. It's cute. Reward. Response. Cute craving, sorry. Cute craving, reward, response. Cute craving, response, reward. So, there are hundreds of habits. Are you in control of them? Am I in control of my habits? How many of the ones do I have to reprogram to myself? The religion that you believe or don't believe. Did you choose that? Or were you indoctrinated and programmed into by society, parents, friends, peers, books, even? How much of it was a deliberate, conscious, logical, thoughtful, reflective choice versus a survival habit to just keep you alive and keep you functioning and keep you in the tribe, keep you in the family unit because an outcast is someone who is less likely to survive. And so you had to say sorry because you didn't want to be an outcast or you had to believe what the other people believed. Otherwise, you wouldn't be with the group. But now you can choose your own group. Now you're free. You're free to be who you want to be. And that closes off chapter three. In the next chapter, we're going to discuss the four laws of behavior change. And we're actually going to get into how to tangibly really practical steps to break down and change habits, make them easier, make them harder, and the four different laws to create good habits and break bad ones. I am, I've summarized, I'm summarizing and analyzing the entire atomic habits. So if you want to stay tuned to that, the reality is you got to follow, subscribe on putting this out on all social media platforms, all podcast platforms. Uh, hit the notifications if you want to be notified about them because YouTube won't show them to you because YouTube's up to... There's just way too much inputs coming in and you just probably won't see it. So if you, if you this is something you want to see, you want to stay up to date on, that's what you got to do. I just got to get over myself. I have, I've, I've said before, I have a... a uh, a, ne- a negative association with asking for anything and I just have to get over myself that if the work that I'm putting out there is to be seen more by people who want to see it, I have to say these things uh, at some point to make the work I'm doing more efficient and effective. So this is me in real time getting over my preconceived notions about uh, doing what doing what most people are doing, which is, um, you know, they ask, they ask you to, Hey, can you do the, can, can you, can you, can you hit that button? Can you follow me here? Do whatever you want to do. But if you want to stay up to date, that's what you got to do. Uh, all podcast platforms. I've summarized 48 laws of power, sapien. Oh, I'm doing sapiens. I'm um, should be done. Maybe uh, all done by now, by the time you watch this potentially, um, how to win friends and influence people, 12 rules for life by Jordan Peterson, and a variety of other videos and memoirs and reflective pieces that I've done on this channel and my website. So you can go see them all there. Links are all below. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.